I can tell you simply what dark matter is. But don't think of it as matter. I, I don't want to. I'm a. It's I'm, not, I'll consider. Like I don't. I, we don't know what it is, so I don't even want to use those two words. If if anything, it's dark gravity, because we look in the universe and we see the effects of gravity, and let's say let's add up all the stars and galaxies and and planets and comets and black holes, everything we know about, to account for this gravity that we see, we account for one sixth of the forces of gravity we see in the universe. Mm -hmm. There is no known objects accounting for most of the effect of gravity in the universe. Something is making stuff move that is not anything we have ever touched. And that's something you call, for lack of a better term, dark matter, but that even implies it's matter. What it truly is is dark gravity. According to our current understanding of physics, the matter that we can observe only accounts for about 5% of the entire energy of the universe. Matter as we know it. Atoms, stars and galaxies, planets and trees, rocks and us. This matter accounts for less than 5% of the known universe. About 25% is dark matter and 70% dark energy, both of which are invisible. It, it's dark only in that light doesn't seem to interact with it. Uh, and so we're inferring that there's something there that we can't see. Dark matter is theorized to explain the movement of galaxies and galactic clusters. And dark energy is theorized to explain how the universe is not only expanding, but is accelerating in that expansion. Dark energy, which I'll deal with in the next video, is particularly hard to test because it shows its effect in intergalactic space, the space that is very far away from us. However, dark matter is supposed to be clustered within galaxies, and so we should expect dark matter to be all around us and hopefully detectable. There's almost certainly dark matter streaming through this room right now, but we have no way of, of knowing that it's there. There are actual experiments that are trying to basically catch the dark matter particle in action as it flies by. We've been at this for now a decade, uh, and we have yet to see a dark matter particle. But for all this effort and waiting around, no dark matter has been detected by Fermilab or by anyone else. Unfortunately, we've seen precisely zero dark matter particles so far. Now, the fact that dark matter has not been found is not sufficient to insist that it doesn't exist. After all, the Higgs boson was notoriously difficult to find. However, there is a big difference between the two. The Higgs boson was predicted by the standard model, which is the most successful predictive model in particle physics and maybe all of science. If the Higgs boson did not exist, the entire theory would unravel. However, dark matter is not predicted by a theory, but by the failure of a theory, general relativity. When we look at large scale structures, other galaxies and galactic clusters, they do not behave the way relativity predicts. Of course, when we say Einstein's got it wrong, it's a bit like uh, he's got it wrong perhaps on these larger scales, he's clearly brilliantly correct <laughs> on solar system. Everything within the solar system is beautifully explained by Einstein's theory of gravity. The question today is whether or not you can get rid of all of that nasty dark matter stuff by messing around with Einstein, with general relativity. Of course, I don't want to be flippant about Einstein, but I think it is worthwhile considering that he arrived at general relativity before we even knew that other galaxies existed. In 1920, no one thought to ask, how fast is the universe expanding? Because no one thought the universe was expanding at all. You can't ask questions about the movement of a universe that you don't even know is in motion. You can't ask questions about other galaxies if you don't even know there are other galaxies. So it wasn't until the 1920s that the technology developed well enough so that we could take little fuzzy patches that people had noticed in their telescopes and resolve them and figure out what they are. Then Edwin Hubble shocked the world and declared the universe was bigger than just the Milky Way. People realized that some of these little fuzzy patches are separate galaxies, just like our Milky Way galaxy. So what I'm proposing is that general relativity, which was designed to explain the behavior of matter and space within our galaxy, is insufficient for predicting intergalactic movement. Rather than throw away relativity, I think it's possible we just need to build from it and come up with an even more general, general relativity that includes the behavior of both galactic and intergalactic space, but which does not need dark matter or dark energy. I say the behavior of space because that is precisely what general relativity is about. Einstein gave the world a new picture for what the force of gravity actually is. It's warps and curves. 
in the fabric of space and time. Suddenly space had properties, suddenly space had curvature, suddenly space had a flexible kind of geometry. The moon is kept in orbit not because it's pulled to the Earth by some mysterious force, but rather because it rolls along a curve in the space-time fabric that the Earth creates. Earth is simply following what it thinks is a straight line path, the shortest distance between two points, in this intrinsically curved space. In other words, gravity is the shape of space-time itself. But what exactly do we mean by warping space? Like a massive rubber sheet, space is curved when massive objects sit in it. We all know this visual metaphor as it helps convey a difficult idea, but obviously we cannot take it literally. The metaphor of a ball on a fabric creating a dimpling underneath it only makes sense to balls on Earth, where there is a down, a gravitational well that the ball is sagging toward. In space, there is no down. Down only means toward the massive object. Gravity is spherical, attracting space toward it in all directions. Down isn't really down, it's radially inward. So if we're going to replace this metaphor, how do we visualize it? Let's start from the fabric metaphor, but then generalize it spherically. If you look at the effect that the massive object has on the space-time directly underneath it, you can see that there is more space-time there than further away from the object. The closer you get to the object, the more space-time there is. If you extend that spherically, you see that space-time is denser all around the object, not just in the arbitrary down direction implied by the metaphor. In essence, space-time is clinging to the object. It is denser closer to massive objects and it is thinner further away. We can see this in gravitational lensing, the first prediction of general relativity to be proven true. Thanks to general relativity, we know that light follows the curved geodesics of a gravitational field. Place a strong gravitational field on an axis between a light source and an observer, and voila, you basically have a lens. And galaxy clusters do this all the time, turning the background universe into a funhouse mirror of stretched out and duplicated galaxies. This is a cluster of galaxies called Abel 2218. The thin arcs are actually images of galaxies far beyond this cluster. Each of these images is showing distortion. This phenomenon of bending of light at the interface of two media is commonly known as a refraction of light. Perhaps the metaphor of space-time as fabric is too misleading to be useful. Maybe we should think of it more like a fluid, a fluid that clings to mass. The denser the mass in an object or system, the denser the space-time around it. We see this in galactic disks, the mass of the galaxy creates a lensing effect, distorting our view of the galaxies beyond it. This is actually one of the arguments for dark matter. When we look at other galaxies, there is more gravitational lensing than general relativity predicts. Dark matter is postulated to explain the additional curvature of space within the galaxy. There is an alternate solution, however, which we'll get to later. Let's first look at the other main arguments for dark matter. An astronomer named Fritz Zwicky. Who was looking at the rotation of uh, galaxies, you know, they, they, they go around. And he was looking at the speed of rotation as you move away from the center of the galaxy. So he'd pick some object that was emitting light and he'd look at how rapidly it was going around. The outer parts of the galaxy were rotating fast enough that there must be a lot more mass, otherwise the galaxy would have flown apart. There's simply not enough visible stuff in galaxies to provide enough gravity to hold them together. From what we can see, they ought to fly apart, but they don't. Since then, We've analyzed hundreds of galaxies and they all have the same pattern. They all rotate too fast for their own good. The way this is explained is odd because it's a Newtonian sounding argument. It says you need a lot of mass to attract the mass on the outskirts of the galaxy and keep them from flying off. But we already know that gravity is not the attraction of mass to mass as Newton thought, but is instead the curving of space by mass. So gravity is not really pulling me down to the ground. It is space that is pushing me down. The massive objects on the outskirts of the galaxy orbit because they are riding on the curved space, which is curved precisely by its attraction to the mass of the entire galaxy. In fact, since space is attracted to mass, we should recognize that a galaxy is not just a cluster of stars that rotates through space. A galaxy is both the massive objects within it and the space that is attracted towards those objects. Space is actually moved around with the objects that it's attracted to. As it spins on its axis, as the Earth spins, it drags space into a whirling motion like the air in a tornado. Like mass, the local galactic space itself is also moving around galactic center, 
like a big platter. So what seems to us to be objects moving too fast around galactic center are actually objects moving much slower, but traveling within local space that itself is moving quickly as a disk around galactic center. We're the only two people who aren't moving and the rest of the universe is moving around us. The question that Einstein always asked about speed is, from what frame of reference is the speed being measured? You look peculiar. You're upside down. No, you're the one that's upside down. Let's make up a simple rule that allows two observers to agree on how fast something is moving. We begin at a moving walkway at the airport. The walkway is moving at a brisk three miles per hour. So, if Susan simply stands on the walkway, she is moving at three miles per hour, relative to Sarah who is standing still but not on the walkway. If Susan walks on the walkway at three miles per hour, she can accurately say she is walking at three miles per hour. But Sarah sees her moving at six miles per hour. And if Susan walks against the walkway at three miles per hour, Susan can still say she's walking at three miles per hour. But now Sarah sees her as standing still. Zero miles per hour. So it's possible that the outskirt objects, which seem to be moving too quickly from our frame of reference, are not from theirs. They are traveling in a frame of reference which is itself in rotating motion, at least from our point of view. The reason why all objects in the galaxy are moving around galactic center at about the same speed is that galactic space itself is spinning like a platter and carrying all the objects upon it. The objects also have local motion within the galaxy, but it is almost negligible in comparison to the spin of space-time itself. This is a turntable. We say that we are in a turntable frame of reference because the camera is mounted to the turntable. From this frame of reference, it appears that the turntable is stationary as the world spins around us, despite the fact that our experience tells us that it is the turntable that is spinning. We see this with spiral galaxies. The spiral is clearly caused by a galactic center which rotates faster than the outskirts, but we don't observe those spirals getting denser and denser, as we would in, say, a smoothie blender. Of course, the blender has a container, which creates friction on the outside particles, slowing them down. The galaxy, however, has no real container and very little friction to slow it down. The galaxy is like a near frictionless smoothie that just spins and spins instead of blending. This is how I see the evolution of a galaxy. A local clustering of matter in the early universe attracts space to it, also bringing whatever matter was in that space. This clustering gets denser and denser and starts spinning as all objects forming in space do. This local cluster eventually becomes a star, then a black hole, then a supermassive black hole, and the space-time around it, and all the matter within that space-time, start getting dragged in an ellipse around it. That according to Einstein's math, a spinning black hole can literally drag space along with it. At first, only the closest space-time to the supermassive black hole gets dragged around, but over time the entire galactic plane of space-time is spinning. The amount of spiral in a galaxy is like a stopped clock, which reveals how long it took for the entire plane to start spinning. Somehow the black hole is able to influence the entire galaxy and it's actually modifying, perhaps, how the galaxy forms, how it evolves. Everything in our galaxy, the Earth, the Sun, a million million stars, are all spinning round the supermassive black hole at the center. I think we don't need dark matter to explain extra gravity in the galaxy. We just need to recognize that the entire galactic plane of space can move independently of the intergalactic space around it and can spin in a reference frame that appears much faster than Newtonian gravity would allow. Even if a spinning reference frame still has some centrifugal force that would fling galaxies apart, it is worthwhile considering what happens in a rotating reference frame full of fluid. This dense creamer is going to sink, hits the bottom and immediately spreads out. We've set up a, tr a record player, as you see here, and we've got a comparable tank of water on it and we've let that tank of water spin up so that all the, the fluid is moving at the same rate as the record player. So all the fluid mechanics knows about the rotation of the table. And now we're gonna do the exact same experiment where we pour in the creamer. And what you see is a different behavior. The fluid this time forms an axialized column. All the fluid motions are aligned with the rotation axis. So if space-time is something like a fluid, then it may actually help keep the matter within the disk 
rather than sending it flying out. So what other evidence do we have that local galactic space-time is like a denser fluid moving independently of the less dense fluid around it? Let's look at the behavior of an object spinning in fluid in order to make our predictions. Above the sphere, the die lines rotate clockwise. Below the sphere, the ink near the bottom shows counterclockwise rotation where the vortex tubes are lengthened. So, we should expect that the space-time immediately north and south of galactic center should also form a vortex. It should be twisted in a long corded spiral. And that is exactly what we find. When we observe the X-ray output from the supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies, we find that the X-rays follow what appear to be spiral lines outward, both north and south. However, we know that X-rays do not travel in spirals. All electromagnetic radiation only travels in straight lines, but straight lines moving in curved space appear to be curved from another reference point. Thus, if we observe X-rays traveling in spirals, we know that the space-time itself is spiraled. The X-rays are traveling in a straight line path on a spiral pathway. The X-rays are like the dust in a dust devil, showing us an otherwise invisible spiral phenomenon that defines the path of the X-rays. This also explains why galactic gravitational lensing is stronger than general relativity predicts. As the space-time in a galaxy spins, it twists and warps the space-time adjacent to it. As light moves from the dense spinning medium into the less dense warped space-time next to it, we should expect a strong refractive effect. That galactic adjacent space-time also allows us to make another prediction from fluid dynamics. At the boundary layer just north and south of the spinning disk of galactic space-time, the adjacent space-time should twist and buckle, taking on wave-like shapes. If we could look north or south from a galactic center and visualize that extra galactic space, it would look like this smoothie image with a twisted center and a wave-like radial structure. Just as different flows of water can ride upon each other, the galactic space flows between the wave-like contortions of the adjacent space-time north and south of it. And indeed, if we look at the surface topology of a galactic disk, we see that it is deformed into a complementary corrugated structure, as if it were conforming to that smoothie pattern. We see this most strikingly in our neighbor galaxy Andromeda. Celestial objects are free, but guided by the curved shape of space-time, like the path of a boat over the surface of the sea which follows the undulations of the waves. In our galaxy, as it spins, the matter within it follows a wave-like path, oscillating up and down as it circles galactic center. If we see space-time as fluid-like, we can imagine the galactic disk as one rotating fluid plane which flows along a wave-like corrugated path defined by the contiguous intergalactic space-time, both north and south of the disk. In this way, we see that galactic disks can spin free of the space-time fluid around them, but still be shaped by the fluid dynamics that the spinning causes. There is one last dark matter phenomenon that we need to explain as it was the first observed. Clusters of galaxies all orbit around their common center of mass. Caltech professor Fritz Zwicky looked up to the neighboring coma cluster of galaxies and observed something strange. When he measured what the motions were in the coma cluster of galaxies, he got an estimate for how much mass there was in that cluster then he compared it to how much mass you could actually see by looking at the galaxies. Something didn't add up. The galaxies were moving too fast within the cluster for the amount of illuminated stuff he could see. Of course, my answer for galactic clusters is the same as for galaxies. Just as local galactic space-time can move independently of the intergalactic space-time around it, so too are galactic clusters and superclusters moving independently of the even less dense space around them. There are many different moving reference frames in the universe at many different scales, and they give the illusion of objects moving faster than they should when they are really about space-time itself moving. I will expand this theory to dispel dark energy in the next video.